Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today in the video, guys, we're going to be talking about why pilots sometimes lose control of their aircraft. How is it that seemingly perfectly capable new aircraft suddenly fall out of the sky? Stay tuned. Wind 31016, everyone right, this video is brought to you in cooperation with Brilliant.org. Now, Brilliant.org will make it fun and interesting for you to improve on your math skills and your physics skills. The 501st of you who uses this link here below will get 20% off the annual fee of Brilliant, but it's completely free to check it out. So I suggest you do just that. Sync rate, pull up, pull up, pull up. Okay, guys, um, I want to start this video out by emphasizing that Flying is among the safest ways of transport that exists today, okay? It is very, very safe. There are thousands, tens of thousands of aircraft that are flying every single day, covering millions of um, nautical miles, without a single incident happening. And this is probably why, whenever something does happen, media blows it up to a huge thing. And that gives you the false sensation of it being unsafe to fly even though they don't say anything about the millions and millions of flights that happens without anything, okay? It's because it has high news value, it's very dramatic, it's very interesting from a media point of view. But having said that, there are actually accidents happening. There's no denying that. And among the most um, serious accident types, we have something called loss of control in flight. Loss of control accidents are serious for the simple reason that, as the name suggests, the pilots are not longer controlling the aircraft. And that can happen for a couple of different reasons. Should be mentioned as well that very rarely does an incident like that happen only because of one reason. It tends to be a series of unfortunate combination of events that leads up to a loss of control in flight. Um, incident. But broadly speaking, you can divide them into four different categories. So I'm going to go through all of these four categories, okay? But I want you to stay tuned towards the end because at the end I'm going to be talking about us, the pilots, the human factor part of this, and what we in the airlines are doing to mitigate against that threat. Um, the first kind of category that I want to cover are environmental reasons, okay? Environmental threats towards the safety of the aircraft. These tend to be um, environmental factors like, for example, um, thunderstorms. Uh, thunderstorms have a tendency to, to create a lot of um, vertical and horizontal movements of air, which can affect our um, airspeed and our controllability of the aircraft. On top of that, you have things like icing conditions, winter operations, which I covered in my last video, um, and a combination of those, which tends to be the case when you have uh, thunderstorms. So the way that we mitigate against that threat is by proper planning, first of all. In the morning, when we get to the, um, the, the briefing room, we will gather together all of the MET data for the day. We're going to look what the forecast is saying. We're going to look for threats like, you know, severe turbulence, icing conditions, thunderstorms, snow... Um, slippery runways, things like that, and we will have a plan in force for it. If the weather is too bad, well then we won't use that airport, we will go somewhere else, or we might delay the flight. Once we're airborne, well then we have our excellent weather radar, and the weather radar will be giving us um, ample time to kind of move away from thunderstorm, for example, and it will st stop us from you know, flying into an airport which has thunderstorms bang on top of the approach. Together with that, we also have very strict rules as to how close to a thunderstorm we can go, you know, what kind of wind limits we can accept, how much crosswind we can accept, and things like that. And all of that together gives a very robust framework to, to stay away from um, loss of control issues due to weather phenomenon. 
If you guys are actually interested in seeing how we deal in case we would actually end up in a wind shear, a wind shear is a very quick change in um, wind direction, which can be either a positive wind shear, which means that we get extra speed, or a negative wind shear when we get less speed. If you want to see how we actually do this, if you download the Mentor Aviation app, which you have links to down here, the app is completely free, but inside of the app, I have created some training um, scenarios where you get to see me and a colleague of mine flying through, for example, a wind shear escape maneuver, both during takeoff and during landing. And it's literally like sitting on the jump seat because it's filmed in 360. You can scroll around or you can move around or you can put it in a headset and actually sit together with me while I'm executing these maneuvers and show you how it's done in real life. So that's environmental. That's number one. The second reason is foul play. So that's when you have criminal intent behind the loss of control. So that's someone who wants to damage the aircraft or hurt the crew and the passengers on board. Now this is extremely rare. And the reason that this is so rare is because the airport and us have built up huge security and safety measures in order to safeguard the aircraft. So you will have noticed this when you go through airport security, you think that it's annoying, but it's there for a reason. On top of that, we also screen all hold luggage. So everything that goes into the hold of an aircraft is going to be, have been x-rayed. It might have gone past um, bomb sniffing dogs, drug sniffing dogs, things like that. All right. So all of these different safety measures are in place in order to keep um, explosive materials or anything malicious to get on board the aircraft. Now, the security measures does differ a little bit throughout the world. Some countries are better at it. Some countries are a little bit worse at it. Um, so there has been incidents. And what I should say is that where there has been incidents, the security measures always goes up uh, enormously after those incidents. But a very famous, very recent incident was the um, the um, Airbus 320 that was flying from Egypt to Russia, I think it was back in 2016, who, when they were flying over the Sinai, um, just disappeared off radar. And it's believed that in that case, a couple of airport workers had actually put on board a small bomb inside of a Coca-Cola can that was hidden inside of the um, passenger cabin, and that exploded somewhere mid-flight. And obviously, if that happens, you know, if all the security protocols have failed and this happens, there's very little that we as pilots can do to, um, to do anything about it. But I should tell you that we do actually have procedures in force in case we would find a bomb. Um, there are places in an aircraft where a potential bomb can be put where it makes the least possible damage. So there are security measures for that as well. The third thing that I want to, to talk about is technical failure. Now, technical failure is also extremely rare. And the reason that that is so rare is because we have very, very good maintenance facilities. Maintenance of an aircraft is paramount, and every airline in the world knows this. There are the manufacturers, Boeing, Airbus, so on, they have set maintenance schedules that every aircraft has to go through, and there are bigger checks and there are smaller checks, and all of these have to be gone through meticulously. On top of that, we have different types of components inside of an aircraft. We have either components that have safe life, which means that they are supposed to be used for a limited amount of time. And when that time is over, they get replaced, no matter if they're failing or not. And on top of that, you have the fail safe principle. That means that if you have a critical component, it is always backed up by something else. So you have two pilots, two engines, two ways of controlling the aircraft in roll, so on, several hydraulic systems. And that's because we know that a machine is a machine and some parts in a machine, even though we maintain them to the highest possible standard, can still break for one reason or another. And then you need to have a backup system that can take the load of that fail system. And that's what we do. So an aircraft tends to be extremely well built up when it comes to, to the technical specifications 
and the maintenance. The, the engineers out there, if you're an engineer and you're watching this, you are our heroes. You are the ones that are keeping us safe every day and we thank you for your dedication. Now, there have been accidents. There have been loss of control accidents because of uh, failed components as well. A, a very famous example of that was Alaskan Airlines Flight 261. You will have links to that down here. Um, basically, that was a flight where the jack screw that is controlling the horizontal stabilizer uh, failed and it let the horizontal stabilizer out of control. And the, basically, the horizontal stabilizer is the component that controls the stability of the aircraft and helps us to trim the aircraft. Together with the elevator, it helps us actually pitch the aircraft up and down. And in this case, uh, the jack screw actually got loose. And when that was loose, that's the thing that's controlling the movement. Well, then the stabilizer started moving like this and it pitched the aircraft down and turned it over into inverted flight. The pilots tried heroically to save the aircraft, to get it back on its correct keel again, but it couldn't be done. And unfortunately, the aircraft crashed into the sea. Uh, now, it should be said that those pilots probably did save hundreds of people anyway, because at the first sign of problems, they asked air traffic control to be vectored out over the, um, the sea outside of Los Angeles to do some flight control tests there. And if they hadn't, it's likely that they would have crashed in a, in a uh, heavily dense or a densely populated area. And that might have killed people on the ground. So they did a fantastic job from the circumstances. And it, it was very unfortunate that it led to that uh, outcome anyway. But then we have the fourth reason. Now, the fourth reason is us pilots, okay? There are two of us in the cockpit. But we have to remember that pilots essentially are, we are the same monkeys as our ancestors were. Our um, balance systems, our situational awareness is built on our senses. And our senses were not built to fly aircraft. So, this means that we have to rely on our instrumentation and we also have to rely on standard operating procedures because people make errors, people make mistakes. This is why we're two of us, so that we can pick each other's mistakes up um, and the standard operating procedures are there so that we know what the other pilot is supposed to do at every given point. That way we can quickly find that he or she is not doing what they're supposed to do and pick it up. All right, so that's why everything we do from when we start the aircraft up until we climb, cruise, descend, and land is done following very strict procedures. And they have to be because without that, there's nothing to hold on to. So, like I said, our senses can be a problem and it becomes a problem when we can't trust our instruments because a pilot from the first day you start try, um, flying instrument flights, as in when you start training to fly an instrumentation, are taught to trust the instruments. The instruments will not show the things that our brain will tell us is happening because our brain get very quickly confused. The instruments will tell us, no, we are flying straight and level, even though our senses is telling us that no, we're actually in a turn or we're climbing. So we're taught to, to focus on them, but also our airspeed. Um, what has happened on a few occasions is um, problems with airspeed. Now, I mentioned this in my previous episode about wind drops. If you haven't seen that, check it out. Uh, if the pitot tubes ice up, so if you have a problem with the de-icing system, the pitot tube ice up or there's a failure with the pitot tube, there might be some component that, you know, a technical component that is not working. Well, then the instrumentation is not going to work properly either. And then it is really important that we do the set security procedures that we have in force, which in this case is the airspeed unreliable memory items, which includes disconnecting the autopilot and autotrottle, turning off the flight directors, and setting a pitch and power to keep the aircraft flying. That is done so that the aircraft does not go into a crazy nose dive or a climb or a stall before we can troubleshoot and see what happens. So we set the pitch, the thrust, and then we start troubleshooting to see, okay, which instrumentation is actually working, what can we do? And even if we don't have 
airspeed. Even if the airspeed is completely gone, it's perfectly flyable, the aircraft. Okay? But there is something, a very insidious thing that can happen, especially during, for example, a go-around, where, um, where we both pitch the aircraft up and we add thrust at the same time. The problem with our senses is that, like I said before, um, it doesn't really know that we're flying. Okay, so if we pitch an aircraft up, it means that we are being pushed back into our seats because of the pitch. But as we're adding thrust, we're also, because of the acceleration, being pushed back into our seats. Now the brain takes those two and put them together and say, okay, you are pitching much, much more than you should. So if a pilot during, a, for example, a stressful go-around where there's loads of turbulence and stuff happening around, if they're doing a go-around, especially at low weights, and they add thrust and they pitch up at the same time, the brain is going to tell them, no, you're pitching way too much. And if the pilot is not really concentrating and looking at the pitch attitude at that point, well, then you might try to pitch forward in order to stop what you believe is a very steep climb. And this has happened on a few occasions, and it's believed to be the cause uh, of the Fly Dubai crash in um, Rostov Ondon in Russia. Remember the news coverage of an aircraft just flying, basically controlled flight straight into the ground. Very similar to a, another accident of a 737 in uh, Kazan, also in Russia, I believe. Anyway, uh, where another um, where an aircraft also flows straight into the ground. This is believed to be caused by somatographic illusion. And that is that the brain is being is tricking the pilots into believing that they're climbing too fast, which makes them push down, which makes them go into a you know a very steep descent. And if that happens after a go-around, you're already close to the ground, there's probably not enough time to level the aircraft out. So like I said before, the, the human factor tends to be the ultimate. That's the hum we are there to save all of these other things happening. So the first three, any of those can be saved by the humans. Okay? The reason that we have pilots in because, is because we have the ability to adapt to situations. We can see that, A, we have a technical failure, we have a thunderstorm. We can combine those things and say, right, in this situation, let's go somewhere else and save the situation. But on top of that, if the... If the, the um, human element also fails, that's when it can lead to a fatal accident. So when the, in the news reporters, for example, are really quick to say that it was the human factor that caused the incident, well then you have to dig a little bit deeper. You have to see that all of these kind of holes, you have, there's, a, there's, a famous, um, there's a famous theory called Dr. Reason's cheese, um, Swiss cheese model, where he's basically aligning, um, saying that there are safety measures. All of the safety measures are like slices of cheese. Those slices of cheese have holes in them. And it's only when the cheese slices are aligned so that all holes align, so that an incident can go from the beginning through all of these safety lengths and towards the end, that's when an accident occurs. And the human factor is the last line of defense. That's where it stops. The, bu the buck stops with us. And when that fails, that's when it goes bad. Okay? Well, so what do we do then? What do the airlines do? Well, uh, the airlines are aware that there have been accidents caused by human factors. So we do a lot of CRM training, making sure that we understand each other and we communicate in a good way. Uh, but we've also realized that uh, there's not as much hand flying going on anymore. Um, before, the aircraft were largely hand flown, which means that the, the handling skills during a go-around, for example, was there. But since we're flying more and more modern aircraft, we're using the autopilot more and more, we've realized that there is a problem here. Pilots need to hand fly the aircraft, to know the aircraft, to feel it. So. Uh, a few years ago, um, we started doing something called Upset Prevention and Recovery Training, UPRT training. And that was basically the airline saying that, okay, in each simulator session that you do, you have to do some proper hand flying training. That might be a hand flown circuit, there might be a raw data ILS hand flown, it might be stall training, steep turns, uh, upset 
recovery as in being put in an unusual attitude and having to recover from it. But it has to be practiced in a simulator environment all the time. Because obviously we can't practice these things on board an aircraft. So it is now being practiced on each six month the pilots will go through a UPRT uh, module to make sure that we are up to the task if something were to happen. So you can rest assured that we are. Right guys, having said that, um, all of these things, for example, the somatographic illusions, the fact that you know acceleration will push you back into your seat or um, the, the pitch will do the same. In order to understand these things, you have to you know, know your physics and your maths. It's an essential knowledge. This is why I keep pushing every time that you guys need to be up to speed to maths and physics if you want to become a pilot. Our sponsor to this episode, Brilliant.org, does exactly that. And it does it in a way that is interesting. I actually go in there myself sometimes, check out the weekly nut that they have, the problem-solving part, and I will try to solve it. And uh, If I solve it, they will say, congratulations, you are among the 10% that managed to solve this. And if I don't solve it, they will give me the tools needed, explain how to solve it, how to think, how to kind of divide a problem into manageable chunks and then go on to the next one. So it's a fantastic way for you to improve your skills, which you will need for your pilot training if you're going that way. So five on the first of you who uses these links below, you get 20% off the annual fee, but it's completely free to check it out. So do that. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are out there and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Say bye. -bye.